Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to part three. Today, well, not today, it's still the same day, but in this tutorial, we're, we're going to be covering the before start procedures as well as the start procedures. And we'll, we'll be going over both engine variants. Um, there, there is a slight difference when starting each of the engines. Um, um, but yeah, I'm going to be explaining the engine procedure for both engines because they're a bit different. And same thing with any other procedure, you'll, if there are differences for the engines um, that you would do differently, which there are a few like minor things um, here and there, don't worry, I will or have already mentioned it in the past or will in the future, um, what those differences are and what you need to worry about um, if there really is anything. So anyways, um, today's tutorial, or not today's, but <laughs> you know what I mean. In, in this part, uh, you'll, we'll be going over the before start procedures um, assuming that we're going to be using the APU and pushback. So we're, so we're assuming that we're going to be push, pushing back. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, we'll check in a second, the, this aircraft actually does not have an air starter unit simulated. Like, any builds have not implemented an air starter unit, um, so I don't think I could really do a tutorial on how to start the engines with an air starter unit, because um, I would actually I would actually include that as a clip or as a separate tutorial, like for supplementary, supplementary procedures. Supplementary procedure. There we go. That's how I, that's how you mean, mean to say it. Um, but yeah, I would I would probably do like a separate tutorial on supplementary stuff, such as uh, single engine taxi, which I'll be covering for sure because that's I think that's well I think that will be simulated, um, and uh, and uh, starting the engines with the, the air starter unit or doing a cross fleet engine start, things like that um, that I do want to cover as well because those are also important and also de-icing procedures in case there would be any icing stuff. Um, so if any builds, if, if any builds, if you guys are watching this tutorial, two things that you could probably implement in the future is a de-icing truck with actual icing accumulation, which can actually cause performance problems with the aircraft. And I don't mean, I don't mean computer performance. You know what I mean with the performance, um, climb performance and possibly stall, um, depending on how much ice, things like that. If you don't worry too much, um, uh, so have having a de-icing truck implemented in this as well as a air starter unit um, have implemented as well. Having those two implemented would uh, make this aircraft a whole nother step better um, than it already is. So yeah, any builds if you're watching, please consider those two options in the future. That'd be freaking awesome. Anyways, we're going to continue here. And so again, we're assuming that we're pushing back, which we are. And most of the case with such a big plane like this, you're probably not going to be at a ramp where you can just taxi out without having to push back anyways. Um, so if we check here, yeah, it's just the AC unit. There is no air sorter unit. So hopefully again, like I said, they'll implement that in the future. So to start the APU, um, there's really, it's very simple, pretty much like any other Airbus. Um, there's two switches or two things you need to use or manipulate before actually starting the APU. If for whatever reason, I'm um, not, I don't understand, uh, or I wouldn't understand uh, in who would be in the situation because obviously you would not want to start the APU if you're still refueling. That would, that's just a bad idea. Those who started the APU uh, in the beginning, um, the APU does use, can use a DC pump, fuel pump, or does use its own fuel pump system. So you don't really have to turn on fuel pumps, but if you want to help the APU out, it is the same exact uh, fuel tank pump that was used earlier for for a quick refuel or for a faster refuel um that would be inner tank pump two um or inner tank one pump two i guess is what what would it be so this switch right here would be used for the apu in case it's not already on anyways we'll select the master switch to on we'll wait about a few seconds like one two three seconds um, and then we'll start the APU by pressing the start button. You'll see the on light illuminate and then the Excel light, which is a blue light, should illuminate afterwards once you see the APU actually spool up. There it is, Excel, and you should now see the APU accelerating, which makes sense, right? Okay, so once the APU started, you'll see that the APU um, will become available. You should verify the voltage and the frequency. You'll see that the EGT starts to um, reach or start to level off. Um, and you'll see the APU uh, uh, system display will actually switch back to its automatic system and you'll see the available light illuminate here. Once the APU is available, go ahead and, as a habit, turn off the external power. And if you have used the air conditioning cart, 
go ahead and disconnect it as well as the external power. Disconnect both at the same time so you don't forget that later. And as soon as the air conditioning card has been removed and you did turn off the packs, turn the packs to auto now and uh, wait in real life. I think you would wait about a minute before applying the APU bleed just so the APU can warm up. But to save some time today, I'm going to go and turn the APU bleed on now. You should then see the, the um, flow valves illuminate here if you're using the APU so the APU bleed valve should be open here so the flow bar as well as the trans uh, the, the cross feed valve should be in the inline position and you'll see the flow bars on the packs illuminate as well that's, that's what you check once we start the AP uh, the engines you'll see that the flow valves here should then be illuminated etc uh, uh, etc et so yeah um, but yeah, for now, you want to make sure that the, these indications are as they are and the packs are currently running, which they are. So once the packs are running, um, since we already got a clearance, you would normally start your, you would normally start your APU around five to six minutes before pushback. So this is really the time where starting the APU is a good time to get it warmed up, to get the cabin nice and cool or warm, depending on the day. And, um, we'll go and disconnect the external power. Now we're going to go and disconnect the filter, the loader, as well as the air stairs. And hopefully, yep, the door does close automatically, which is nice. We'll keep the chocks in just for now. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the performance calculator. We're going to calculate our information. We can just simply click FMC data and everything that, uh, so it will populate our takeoff weight, our ICAO, as well as our runway. And the rest of the information will actually be required. Um to put in manually because ADA's request currently does not work. As soon as ADA's request works, uh, you'll be able to click that and it should populate everything in here. But currently it does not work. So we're gonna put this in manually via our OFP information. So METAR gives us winds of 340. You can use your keyboard for this at nine degrees. Outside air temperature is 19. Q and H 1014. Runway condition is dry, anti-ice is not required. Config 15 and 0. Start off. So, okay, here's here are a few tips. Runway condition is very self-explanatory. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to switch this up a little bit. You always want to have your outside air temperature set to your current outside air temperature, which you can check here. 21 degrees right now, so it's got warmer. Plus 1. So 22. Your Q&H, you want to have set to your current Q&H minus um, 1 millibar. And in... in, in uh, Inches of mercury would be minus 0 0.03 inches. So we're going to select 1013. Those are the two first things you want to have in. Uh, this is to optimize your performance calculations to the best values out there. Roman condition is very self-explanatory. Anti-ice, um, the the, when would you use anti-ice? Um, again, in standing water, in... Um, in uh, raining conditions or in, in icing conditions, which states if your total air temperature is 10 degrees or lower and you're in visible moisture or you're operating in visible moisture, that's when you should use anti-ice. So if those conditions exist, select your anti-ice to either engine only, engine and wing, or off, um, depending on the conditions. Most likely you would select engines only for engine anti-ice operation. For your config, you would always want to default to 15 uh, flat, slats 15, flaps 0. Um, and so uh, when we calculate this information and it tells you, nope, that's not going to work, then increase the flap. You want to make sure to use the lowest flap setting as possible because that will guarantee the highest flex temperature possible. And the uh, highest flex temperature possible obviously also, um, um, as, as I've stated before, will expand your engine life. Air conditioning, um, as you can see, standard is air conditioning on if you're using a short runway which i think we are so we might consider turning them off but i don't think we need to if you are on a short runway although three dozen meters isn't really that short um, but if you're on a shorter runway you could turn these off or if you require the extra performance because of terrain or hot weather or whatever it may be you can turn them off as well and flex temperature should always be standard too go ahead and compute the values and if they do spit out values that actually are working go ahead and use those um, so yeah, for us, it's very, very, um, very, very, actually very low than what I've used to earlier. So f V1, VR, V2 are really good. Flex temperature of 47 degrees. So we're going to put this in right now. So we're going to start with the left side and then we're going to populate the right side. 
So if it's V1, excuse me, V1 is 158. V2, uh, sorry, VR is I think 162, no, 161. And then V2. Now here you can see V2 is set to FCU. So you would probably assume, all right, let's set V2 in here, um, which is again, it's not a bad thought because that's what you would do in Airbus, I mean Boeing. So 162. And you see F one, it's the F, it says V2162. But in the in this Airbus, in the A300, you can actually um, set this in the, you can actually hard set this, I would say, I guess, uh, in the takeoff page by pressing it, the speed button once. And you'll see that it's preset. So we're now in preset mode, which means now you will set your preset speed of what you want to climb at. We want to climb at 250 in all cases. Um, like I said before, if there are speed restrictions during your flight or during your climb out, it is best to use level change instead of profile mode. We're currently considering profile mode, mode which I'm going to go and activate now. So you'll see P plus climb activated. Um, so best, you, as we all know, um, our maximum speed below 10,000 feet is going to be 250 knots. So you should always consider using 250 knots. If there are speed restrictions, because this plane does not follow speed restrictions, it really does not, go to tactical mode and put the speed restriction in the speed here. But what it will do is it will it will keep its maximum speed at 250, but it will not go above the speed you put in here. So as soon as you clear out the speed, so once you're clear of that constraint, according to the SID, you can clear it out here and it should then accelerate back to 250. Hope that makes sense. So you should you should always consider setting 250 in your preset. Um, again, different airlines do different things. Most a lot of the times, I've also seen real world footage where sometimes they set 220 or some other speed, which is gives you ridiculous climb speeds of like 4,000 feet per minute. Even in the real plane, trust me, even the real plane climbs like like a rocket. So yeah, um, but I like to set 250 because that's um, that gives me a nice climb. Um, it's still fast, and um, that's the standard for today, for these days. And again, if there's a speed constraint, set it in here, in the tactical mode. But there is no speed restraint, so we're gonna directly climb to 250, or, or accelerate to 250. So keep it at 250. Um, and you can see, because we pushed in the FCU speed for V2, it is now populated in here. Next, we're gonna go to the right side. If there was a takeoff shift, so in the A300, again, this uh, any builds have not simulated this, but once they do, um, the A300 ha does have a takeoff shift, but it's not like what we're used to, where you can enter it any value that you would like. Um, there's either, th this is basically like a Boolean um, operation, meaning it's either yes or no. So if it's no, you go you're gonna see the select, and if you press it, which is again not simulated, you would see it says activated. And this will give you a, a takeoff shift of 0 0.5 nautical miles or around 970 meters. That'll be your takeoff shift calculated, and the, and this will uh, take account for it. Thrust reduction, acceleration, these are all depending on noise abatement procedures. We have consi uh, considered a noise abatement departure procedure 1, which will give us an acceleration altitude of 3,300 feet. Um, this, is, uh, this is not AGL, this is MSA, or MSL, I think, BNC level. Or, um, so... Um, you would you would add 15 so okay so, uh, let me go over this um, I think most of you know this thrust reduction is your basically your altitude to which you reduce your thrust and acceleration is when you start to uh, pitch nose down to accelerate in order to clean up the airplane in the Airbus FCOM for the A300 they highly recommend to use to never use below 1500 feet um, above ground um, so that would be 1500 feet plus your current elevation which your current elevation is around 305 feet, which is why it's set to 1805 instead of 1500, because this is based off of your barometric pressure, right, um, of about 320. So um, they recommend never to set your thrust reduction below 1500, so that's what we have, and your acceleration should obviously never be below your thrust reduction. And because we're using noise abatement departure procedure 1, your acceleration altitude should be at around 3000 feet above ground, which is which translates to 33,000 or 3300 feet um, M MSL or MSA. Inch and out should be again also 1500 and 1500 or depending on SOP. So 1805 and 1805. There we go. So takeoff page is set. And there's really not much else to do. 
we have gotten our flex temperature of 47 degrees and this is something you can set immediately as well so set 47 you'll see that the uh, target speed is then set to 1.452 you could select this in here as well um, but the aircraft i believe at least from any build simulation wise um, will do this um, automatically now i don't think the fcom said that it does uh, it automatically you would set this normally um, manually and I think the real plane can actually fine-tune those words currently the any builds have it set to set in increments of 0.1 or I think the real plane can actually you can fine-tune this I think you most definitely can fine-tune this um, to any value you, re you really want so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this to 1.5 because that's our upper limit really and so we're gonna set both to 1.5 of EPR and that should be fine as well once that is set um, uh, you would set your v2 and your green dot speed in your standby asi in here uh, these are set manually so i wonder if this is yes this is a green dot so th here's the green dot you set um v2 in here they i think they've also set vr in here to be honest uh, and then you set your green dot speed which is this sprite here and your green dot speed is the dot speed right here 215 so 215 knots is what this should be at you set these indications to that but because it's manual, um, I mean automatic, uh, it will do it for you automatically. Again, I wish uh, any builds in the future would make this uh, an option between automatic or doing it manually as you wish. Let me give it a little bit more realism. All right, so the pilot flying would set his FMS to the takeoff page as we're used to, and the pilot monitoring would set it to flight plan. Um, we're pretty much aware of this as well. I mean, we're used to it by now. So that's checked and set. Next, if there are any revisions that need to be required for the uh, EFIS, go ahead and set those here or here. Uh, select anything here that need to be revised, which th doesn't need to be. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much done. External power is off and disconnected, so we don't need that anymore. And we can now continue with the before start proceed. Uh, sorry, checklist down to the line. We'll go to checklist and thank you, thank you, thank you, any builds for actually including a real checklist or actual normal checklist and not not saying there is a checklist in there but then it's just basically a, a flows checklist which is t completely different so this is an actual normal checklist that real pilots would use um, a, basically a quick reference checklist um, at least in my own words so yeah before start checklist above the line which is above this little line here uh, so concrete preparation is completed cabin signs are on uh, on and auto uh, fuel quantity is set at uh, 16.4 tons per kilograms, balanced as well, and um, we want to confirm that with the OFP and the load sheet, which is checked. Navigation is checked and set. Landing elevation is set to 300 feet. Uh, altimeters are set 1014 on all four indications, and brake and anti-skid is set to normal and on. So, once the above the line is complete, We'll now uh, request for startup clearance or uh, pushback clearance with ATC. And once we get it, we're going to go and contact better pushback right away. And uh, we're going to go and push back to the right. Please show me where you want to go. There we go. Ground to cockpit. Toe is driving up. There we go. Toe is driving up. And as soon as um, and uh, during the the connection procedure, we can already do our next stuff. The windows and doors, windows, we make sure they're closed. Doors should be closed, which they all are. And normally in the real plane, you'd actually see the slide indication on each door that is armed with slides. Um, so you want to make sure that the slides are armed. But I don't think they have implemented a uh, slide feature yet, unless it's just a passenger thing. But I doubt it. I really doubt it. Beacon comes on because we got clearance to push back, so beacon come on. The c it can come on for the ground crew to let them know that we're about to push back. Uh, and parking brake set is required. Once that is done, we'll do the before start checklist below the line. Windows doors closed, both. Beacon is on, and parking brake is on. The so before start checklist is completed. We're gonna scroll down to the after start once we get going there. He's now connecting. So d during his connection, I'm going to go and explain the s engine start procedure for the Pratt and Whitney engines. And then as soon as, and once we start actually doing the engine start, I'm going to explain the differences between GE and PE, uh, PWs 
And once we start them. Alright, we're ready to push. The throttle levers, we want to make sure they're idle. Which they are. Um, my physical levers as well. We've checked this before, but we want to double check. Just in case we accidentally touch them. And so. So here is the procedure. So you would set your ignition switch to either system A or B start. This is also dependent on the day. So if it's an odd day, select system A. And if it's an even day, select system B. If it's an odd day, so we're going to select system A for start. So we're going to go and release the brakes. Starting pushback and you may start engines. And we're going to select this to system A. You should then see the arm lights illuminate, which they do. And the packs obviously turn off as well, which is completely normal. So for the Pratt and Whitney engines, we're going to start in, you always start engine number two first. Um, I don't ha I've never seen a, a, uh, I've never seen any option where engine number one would be started first. Even in a single engine taxi in the scenario, you would start engine two. Unlike the A320 or some other airplanes where you start engine one for a single engine taxi, in this plane, you would start engine number two pretty much in every single scenario. So engine number two always, always is first. So as soon as we press the start button for engine number two, you should see the arm light illuminate, which it does, which means, oh sorry, the open light illuminate. We already saw the arm light. The open light, which means that the starter valve has been open. We would say valve open. We then verify that the bleed pressure increases, which it should, should do. And we want to verify that the N2 is increasing. If that does, if it does, we say N2. Verify that the oil pressure increases, which in this plane currently is a bit, a bit inaccurate. In the real plane, it would slowly creep up, whereas in this plane, you'll see a jump up to the red mark, which is inaccurate. So, obviously, in the real plane, you would actually, you could check this earlier than what it does. There, you saw it saw a jump up. So we now say oil pressure, uh, and then as soon as oil pressure is available. For the Pratt and Whitney engines, now here's a diff here's a big difference between Pratt and Whitney and GE. In Pratt and Whitney engines, you would actually wait until N2 is at its complete max. Um, so once it's at its complete max and not rotating anymore, um, which is around this time, um, once you see it start to level off, you would then turn on the fuel lever or the high pressure level. So it's still increasing. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we're gonna go and turn on the lever now. When that now it will increase, you'll see oil low pressure light illuminate, which is fine. So that is what you do with Pratt and Whitney engines. In GE engines, Operation complete. Set parking brake. in GE engines, you would set this at around 20% N2. Um, there's really no exact value that has been given by the FCOM. It just says as long as the N2 is above 15%, um, you can then so is so so if you see oil pressure. Um, after 15% and two, you can immediately turn on the high pressure valve. Uh, you'd also make sure you would then say fuel on once you select the fuel lever to on. Uh, you would verify the fuel flow once you see fuel flow, which we, you should m immediately see when turning this on. You'd say fuel flow. Um, once the EGT increases, you should say EGT, or you should announce EGT, and then once you see N1 increase, you should announce N1. At 45% and two, you should see the. Uh, the valve open light extinguish or the valve light extinguish which means that the sorter valve is closed so you would announce valve closed and then uh, you'll wait until the engines are stable so I see my better pushback is not behaving I need to reinstall it better pushback there it goes um, and once the idle values are there you want to verify certain values so N1 which right here should be at around 22% for Pratt and Whitney engines around 64% and 2 around 325 to 425 degrees Celsius on the EGT and around 540 to 620 um, kilograms of fuel flow or fuel per hour burned which is checked so now we're going to start engine number one which is the next engine soon after and we're, I'm just going to not a, I'm not going to explain myself I'm just going to do it as you're supposed to do it valve open and two. Oil pressure. Wait for the uh, N2 to, to max out. I think it's good there. 
fuel on. EGT. Fuel flow. N1. Wait for 45%. Then stop the, cl the clock. Forty-five percent, and start our valve close, and we should be at around twenty-five seconds for the forty-five percent mark. That's checked. That's good. Valve closed, and we'll now wait for the engines to be at idle. So again, twenty-two percent, approximately sixty-four percent, approximately two hundred twenty-five to three hundred, uh, four hundred twenty-five percent. Uh, uh, degrees Celsius approximately in 540 to 625 or sorry 620 kilograms per hour approximately so that's all checked the values are checked now for the differences to GE engines for GE engines again I've already mentioned that um, as soon as you have oil pressure and your N2 is above 15% you can select the fuel lever to on all right so engines are started after engine start Select your ignition to off, and you'll see that the arm lights should extinguish, which they do. AP bleed to off, so you now see the inline lights here and the cross feed valve close. APU can come off because we don't need it anymore. Engine and wing anti ice would be now selected on if the required. And uh, you'd now extend the slats and flaps to your takeoff position. The only time you would not extend your flaps and slats to the takeoff position is if the outside air temperature is below minus 40 degrees Celsius. That is when you would delay the slats and flaps, um, as well as if you're taxiing within slush, slush conditions, um, so standing water or slush again conditions, you would also keep the flaps up until before takeoff. In fact, you keep them up until you're at your holding point uh, before the runway. Um, so that's when you would extend the flaps. But because no, none of those conditions exist, we're going to set our flaps to zero and our slots to 15. So slots 15, flaps zero. The ground spoilers can be armed, which they will be now. Aileron and rudder trim is set to zero. And pitch trim we would also set. This is another thing with pitch trim. If the outside air temperature is again below 40 degrees um, Celsius, minus f it is below minus 40 degrees Celsius, uh, verify the operations just by um, moving it up and down a little bit. Um, so we're going to set our trim now, um, which is, there we go, 1.2 down. We'll go to here, let's go to trim, and set this to 1.2 down. It's about there. Okay, once the pitch trim is set, we'll check our ECAM status, make sure anything that is selected is normal, which it all looks like it is. We are in in uh, in in Great Britain, so actually before pushback, you should set your transponder to TA or transponder out to the report so make sure to set that to ta um, before pushback and then also you would actually start your elapse time those are two things i forgot to mention the we'll run there we go so now um, we've got our elapse time set we check our ecam door page again we want to make sure that all slides are armed but like i said i don't think any builds have actually simulated this to the fullest so you don't see the slide indication on the doors which is fine so we'll cross that out for now and then we do the after start checklist. After start, which is pitch trim is 1.2 up set, sorry, down set, rudder trim zero, you can, uh, spoilers are armed, slats and flaps zero, uh, sorry, 15 and zero, and we can double check this with the indication here. We just checked. Uh, performance and FMAs are checked in red, so uh, performance has been set, V1, VR, V2, and flex temperature is 47 degrees, and our FMA says P, climb, and nav which is checked in our speeds and altitude is all checked and double verified or verified. Um, ECAM status is checked, INTIS is set as required, so off and hand signal has been received. So we're ready for taxi. Once we get, are ready for taxi, um, here are two options. You can either do the, you can either do the flight control check before taxi or during taxi. We're going to go and do it before taxi. So we'll do it just now. So what we're going to do is we're going to select our nose light to taxi. Parking brake can be released. And this is another check. Again, it's not simulated currently. But you would hold down your pedals, your brake pedals, and make sure that the pressure is at zero. In this case, it is simulated. But again, the entire system, braking system, is a bit off and funky, especially with the brake pedals. So um, let's keep that in mind. 
Once that is checked, uh, we'll do the flight control check. So we'll click on flight control and we'll do a flight control check. So full up, pull down, neutral, pull left, verify the spoiler deflection as well, pull right, neutral, and then rudder, full left, pull right, and neutral. The flight control check is complete. After your flight control check is complete, keep it on the flight control page and you'd want to deploy your spoilers to their full detent. If, if the outside air temperature again is um, below minus 40 degrees Celsius. One thing you also want to check is that during aileron check, the rudders, the rudder may move as well because of the yaw dampers. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a, if it's a must or if it's no ways. I don't think so. It says it may happen because of the yaw damper system. So if it's a must, then that means any build hasn't simulated it. But again, I'm not 100% sure on that. Then we go to Ecam and deselect the flight control page. So let's go ahead and get taxiing. And uh, we'll see you once we do the next procedure. At this point, just taxi as normal. Again, speeds are applied to pretty much like in every plane. Max straight speed is 30 knots and max turn speed should be 10 knots. So yeah, let's get out of here. You really only need to give an initial thrust. Um, Alright guys, we are back in the flight deck here. Um, we're now currently taxiing to the runway and this is, our, no, this is not our holding point. This is the holding point before our holding point, which means we're very close to the runway. Um, so we're going to do a couple checks now before we actually get on there. Just to be efficient with time in case ATC wants us to get out of here in a hurry. Uh, we're going to make sure that we got everything set um, prior uh, to uh, reaching the runway. Now because I'm rambling, we might not make it. So things we want to check. Flaps, make sure they're actually set. So if we kept them up earlier um, because of uh, weather stuff, so if the temperature was minus 40 or below, um, Celsius and we kept the flaps up for that or if we're running and standing or if we're f uh, taxiing and standing slush or standing water things like that and we kept the flaps up because of it uh, now it would be the time to put them down so feel free to do so make sure your V2 is set in the uh, FCU um, so what I mean by that so let me let me go ahead and head here Let's let's go to the holding point and then I'm gonna explain in a little bit more detail. Sorry if it's flashing a little bit, it's just a little bug with FS Enhancer once in a while. And Act of Sky, so Alright, so here we are. Parking brake is gonna be applied. So what I mean with that with the F two uh, V two and FCU. So you're probably thinking we already set that, why would you need to reset that? So what it means is if in case we did have to change runway mid taxi or if we have to recalculate our V speeds for whatever reason, wind uplink or new ATIS or whatever it is, um, you would recalculate that and if your sp speeds have changed, you would also want to reset it. So um, basically what I'm saying is if you need to reset the FCU, your V speed, go ahead and do so now. Um, same thing with the initial climb, reset if you need to. You're just basically double confirming all these values one more time. You're double confirming your flight plan, your, uh, your V1, VR flight plan, so runways, SIDS and transitions, uh, clear to altitude, profile make sure that's armed or nav is armed is required so if those two are required go and make sure that those are armed at this point if they're not required um, may maybe consider heading select or level change um, obviously level change cannot be armed until after departure um, so it's considered depending on your situation use the the, res the respective modes here um, today we are using an aren't doing an arm after departure so we're using profile and nav is perfectly sufficient um, is that exactly what we need today. Um, so initial heading, make sure it's set. Again, we're just double checking everything, making sure flight directors are on and that our FMA is actually telling us the information we wanted to tell us. Uh, flight instruments, we want to check, make sure that again, our heading changes if we change our, uh, our uh, position of the airplane, uh, our attitude doesn't go crazy, our vertical speed doesn't go crazy, things like that. We want to make sure that our instruments are really operating as they should. Same thing with the engine indications, all that. Nothing is abnormal. Um, that would make it seem unsafe or somewhat unreliable to fly. Flight instruments, we just covered radar. So weather radar, we can go ahead and turn on now. So system one, we're going to go and set. Um, we're going to follow the same philosophy that system one would be um, if we're the pilot flying. So if the captain is the pilot flying, system two, if the co-pilot is the captain flying. We'll set our weather radar to weather. 
Um, if you wanted weather and turbulence, you could set that as well. Again, currently in op, um, it would be on the ND, but um, a good habit to get into. And especially once the weather radar is implemented, uh, you guys now know how you're expected to operate it or when to operate it. HC code, we double, double confirm. Um, and that is set. Terrain on ND, if that is required, either person would set that. It's not required on our side. I guess our co pilot could set that for us on his side in case of any terrain or hazardous terrain, which in this case is really not important. HC code, um, we just confirm. So takeoff briefing, we'd also confirm. We'd confirm the takeoff runway, all that good information. Whatever. Um, so, what I do want to cover with you guys is again, real quick, is if any of the navigation fails, we've manually entered a VOR here, which is 109.35, uh, which is not a VOR, it's actually, I think, an ILS uh, um, identifier. But either way, this is what we're expected to set. And once we reach one nautical mile from it, we're expected to turn left to 225. Um, and then obviously contact ATC, letting them know, hey, we've got a problem. Um, things like that. So, um, but because we're using nav, we really don't need to worry about this too much, at least not really. Next thing we do is make sure the cabin report has been received. So if the cabin says the cabin is ready, make sure we've actually received that information. Do a takeoff config test. So just hold it down and make sure that the takeoff config test says normal, which it does, and we can let go. Again, check the ECAM, make sure everything, every indication is normal, which it is. And we can now do the before takeoff checklist above the line or down to the line. So flight controls have been checked. Briefing is confirmed. Slats, 15 flaps, zero set on both. Um, so both check that. Performance and FMAs have been checked in red. Takeoff config has been checked and transponder is set. So you would normally um, hope to get this checklist done before getting any clearance to line up with the runway or to get uh, clearance to take off. So now let's say we got clearance to enter the runway. Once that is done, we want to make sure that the approach path is clear of traffic on the right and left side. Camera crew make sure to advise them that, hey, we're about to go. Um, check the brake yellow hydraulic system because we're using the yellow hydraulic system for the brakes. We want to make sure that the reservoir are still, or the quantity is still sufficient. So make sure there's no leakage or anything. Set the outer brake to max. And of course, while doing this, we would um, go to the runway if we got clearance for it. So let's go ahead and line up at this point. Um, ignition, you would set to continuous uh, um, relight if you're, we're running or if we're taking off on standing water slush in uh, severe in severe turbulence or heavy uh, rain. Um, pack valves, if we did keep it, if we did plan for packs off, go and turn them off at this time. Go and set our transponder to TARA and on, make sure it's on, which it is, at least it should be at this point, and you'll s you should see the should see the confirmation here that it gives you a six nautical mile radius for it. I believe it's a radius, yes. Um, and then exterior lights. So we're going on the runway. When you once you're clear on the runway, strobe lights to on, nose lights to take off, runway turnoffs to on, and the landing lights you extend. You're going to select off instead of on. You set off, which means they're going to extend, um, but not turn on just yet. You you only turn them on once you actually got takeoff clearance and you're on the runway. So once but those two conditions apply, you can then turn them on. And once you've done that, do the before takeoff checklist below the line. So cabin is secured, TCAS is TARA, packs are set on, ignition is off, and anti-ice is off. The before takeoff checklist is completed. So we want to use as much runway as possible. It, is, it isn't a very long runway, so we can use as much possible. So we're going to start right here. And once we're ready for takeoff and get takeoff clearance and we're on the runway, any lights can come on. We're going to let go. The, we're actually not going to let go of the brakes. Sorry, we're not going to let go of the brakes. We're going to set an initial of 40% and 1 for the GE. And for the Pratt Winnie, that translates to 1.05 to 1.1 EPR. We're going to set 1. approximately in that range there. We're going to start the clock, and once that is checked, release the brakes, and you can set toga, which is this little screw down here. Then confirm thrust, 
SRS runway. Um, sometimes runway does not show up, which is perfectly fine. And we now depart if my rudders want to work. Okay, they do, but they're not very responsive. So, so at 80 knots, you want to confirm your thrust is set, which we're just going to say it is. 100 knots checked. I don't know why my brakes just applied there. Sorry about that. That's I think that's a bug with the airplane, to be honest. But we're gonna be closest here, so V1, rotate, and give it nice pressure. And there we go, there's our rotation. The nav is green, that's checked. So yeah, maybe because there's a currently a bug with the auto brake. Maybe keep the outer brake system off. Um, I think there's a little bug with that. Now we're supposed to expect it to turn left. Let's go and trim the aircraft out because it does not have fly by wire. 1500 feet has now just been um, checked. You'll see that the climb thrust is set. Make life a little bit easier for us, we're going to go and select our autopilot one on. And you'll see that climb thrust is set to auto here, and then you'll see the climb mode is active. That is what you want to check for. Once climb thrust is set, gear should have been up, so we're going to set the gear up. And once we reach 3000 feet, which we programmed in the FMC here, acceleration altitude it should accelerate to 250 or the tactical pre-selected speed, whichever one is lower. So we'll then clean up the flaps and slats as required. We'll flaps up or slats up or flaps zero. And then once the gear's up and the indications are out, you go and select the gear to off. Turn off the runway turnoff lights and run off, turn off the nose lights. And normally the spoilers should still be spoilers should still be armed at this point, which I think again is a bug with the auto brake system, to be exactly uh, to be honest. So we're gonna disarm them. And that is the after takeoff procedure. So I apologize that it was a bit weird or a bit funky. Um, yeah, I've actually had this issue now twice in a row with the auto brake system deploying. But honestly, I have no idea why that is. Yeah, now we're going to be accelerating. So we're going to go and pretend we've been cleared to our cruise level of 330. Once we have, what you can do is you can already set your altimeters to standard. And that is set, so standard. And we'll do the after takeoff checklist. So, if slats and flaps are retracted, landing gears up and neutral, packs are on, and altimeters are set to both. So talking about the packs, so if you did select the packs to off, um, you would turn pack 1 on as soon as you have, as soon as you select climb thrust, as soon as climb thrust is applied, and uh, you'll set, and then once uh, you're cleaned up, so once the airplane is cleaned up, so the flaps are set to position zero, you'll select pack two on. That's when you select the packs to on, depending if you have turned them off for departure. So now we reached 10,000 feet, so now we'll climb to our what our cost index has been given. Um, so that's about the speed of 324. We'll accelerate to that. At 10,000 feet, landing lights come off. Depot signs as required. We're going to keep them on for just a little longer. If we have any VORs that are man manually tuned, which there are, uh, we'll select this back to nav, and it should automatically tune the VOR back again. If we have a secondary flight plan, which we do, and we don't need it anymore, go ahead and clear that out now. So we're going to clear the secondary flight plan, and then we'll go to progress on this side. We'll again confirm the cruise the optimum and the max levels, make sure that's checked. We're gonna, go, we're gonna clear our return waypoint, which is our runway, and we're gonna make sure flight plan is on this side, which is the pilot not flying side. Altimeters are already set to standard, and every t if you did set anti-ice and the con and the ignition switch to continuous relight, you always wanna make sure if you're still flying in those conditions, keep them as is. If you're not flying in the conditions that they're required for, you can turn them off. I'm quite happy now with the performance and I don't think we're expecting too much turbulence so I'm going to go and turn on turn off the seatbelt signs at this point. 
And uh, yeah, you'll see this indication quite a bit. But um, it is an icing range, but it doesn't mean you're in icing conditions. So don't take this as a note that you have to turn on the engine or anti or wing anti ice. Um, this is tell you tells you that your onset air temp or your true air temperature is below what um, it is asked, asked to be at, which again is totally normal. All right, then at twenty thousand feet. Um, we would again confirm the seatbelt signs, the altimeters, again double check anti-ice if we still need it, if we require it, if we don't, turn it off, if we do, keep it on, or turn it back on depending on the situation. Again, um, you want to always double check your conditions you're flying into, if you're flying with invisible moisture, and if you are, um, turn them on and continu continuous ignition or continuous relight the same exact situation. A few things we need to check here. So. Ecam ammo is fine, really, there shouldn't really be a message, um, there really should not be any messages, except if Ecom flow is selected, then that's obviously a normal indication, and we're not going to turn that off, that's, that's perfectly fine, but otherwise there shouldn't really be an indication, unless maybe even seatbelt signs are still on, again, anyways, if there is an indication, make sure that's really how it should be, um, but this is what it should look like, um, especially using um, the cargo variant since econ flow is pretty much used all the time. Next, you want to check the TRP right, right here. And you want to make sure this is either set to climb mode or cruise mode. Um, it is, should be in auto, which is, which is exactly what you want. Um, it will automatically switch to auto normally. And you'll want to check the status. It is currently in cruise mode, which is perfectly fine. You can set us mem change like uh, mem uh, memo change like we checked here is fine. We then go to the system pages and we want to review the system pages. Now this is normally done. Um, yeah, this is done around every 30 minutes. But as soon as you reach cruise, this is something you want to check. So we're gonna go and open the page here. We're gonna go through s specific systems. I don't think we're gonna go through all of them, but we're just gonna go through some of them, um, but most of them. So engine indications. We want to verify old uh, pressure, oil pressures, and temperatures. Um, so PSI here is at 172, 172, that's in the green. Temperatures are around 86 degrees Celsius. Go through hydraulics. Again, you want to verify that the hydraulic pressure is in the green. And you'll, you will see, or the f you, you, you want to actually look at the quantities, and you will see that the green quantity, the green hydraulic quantity, will be a bit lower than the rest, simply because of the, uh, because the green hydraulic pump um, is actually operated, or actually operates that landing gear and because of that you'll see that the um, that uh, the green hydraulic system will be a bit less than the rest of them simply because of it. Go to AC, you verify that the generators are um, sufficient so they're running at around 115 volts plus or minus a few and at 400 hertz temperatures are fine and you'll see all the buses are being run. DC battery charging status. So currently the batteries are completely charged, so you don't see any charging status, which is exactly what we want to see. But if they are charging, obviously you want to make sure they actually are. Bleed, just check the bleed parameters. Everything looks perfectly fine there. Then go to conditioning, check our temperatures, pressurization. Differential pressure is checked within limits. Your uh, vertical speed should be close to zero as possible since we're now level off. And our cabin altitude obviously should be within limits. Fuel, check the distribution, make sure uh, we still have the amount of fuel that we've, uh, that we're expected to have at this point and make sure that the, uh, the distribution is, is uh, fine as well, which it is. Then next thing is, or the last thing is the flight control page and you want to verify that all the systems are running and everything is in a normal status um, as it should be. One thing you can definitely always verify and make sure it's working or is uh, sufficient is the fuel flow. Uh, oil temperatures and by vi of uh, vibrations, etc., and you can check the temperatures here as well in the cabin altitude. So this is a nice little overview. Overview. It's kind of like the uh, cruise page for the A320. That's what that kind of is. And then every 30 minutes, what you want to check at every waypoint. So in, in around every 30 minutes, approximately once passing a waypoint. So we're going to be passing Redfa here in a second. You want to verify a few things. So you want to check what the fuel on board is predicted to be at um, according to the OFP. You then want to cross check that the fuel on board um, is actually very close to what was planned at that waypoint. So what you have to do is you really have to fly over the airway point, check your fuel on board at that time that you pass it and then verify it with your OFP. The next uh, item you want to check 
every 30 minutes is your optimum flight level. So if you are planning for a step climb, which is not simulated in this airplane, unfortunately, but if you are planning on a step climb, um, check if your optimum flight level actually allows it, which in this case it would. Uh, you want to always step climb with a minimum 2,000 feet um, up to 4,000 feet, so 2,000 or 4,000 feet. Normally it's 2,000 feet. Um, so if it does let you step climb to 2,000 feet and you do have a step climb uh, planned, consider step climbing if you like. Next thing is the NAF accuracy check. So go to the progress page. And um, you know what? I think this is also a little bit, um, a little bit, how do you say, limited. I don't think they've simulated every little detail in this case either. So you want to check your nav accuracy. So when, so when I or low is indicated on the progress page, which I don't see any indication for that here, um, then you want to you want to do a, uh, a VR update. So you want to enter or tune in a VR in here, and then put the VR in here as well, and confirm the differences between them, and then update your information there. Um, the details I'm not going to go into because I, this happening is pretty much very rare i'm gonna go and clear this out we don't need this and the next thing we would do is set our radar tilt uh, at zero or cruise you want to set this at zero um so at or above twenty thousand feet set it at zero and uh, that'll give you the best uh, weather in case there's weather right in front of us that we need to worry about and then also want to monitor the cabin temp that's another thing that we want to monitor above ten thousand feet you could turn off the terrain radar but some so that is pretty much all you check so let's go over it real quickly again so trp make sure it's at the cruiser climb mode um you can set as a mem check memo check verify that all the indications are normal you then check your uh, respective systems uh, indications make sure they're all in a normal position or normal states you always wanted to monitor your oil quantity make sure you're not um you don't have a leak same thing with the fuel uh, so flight progress every 30 minutes over a waypoint you want to verify your fuel so we were expected to have 11.7 .7 tons at redfa and we have 12.4 so we're definitely good on fuel so that's what you check every 30 minutes about you want to check your optimum flight level every 30 minutes see if that's um, sufficient if you are planning on a step climb and then your nav accuracy in the progress page as well which i think is not very um 100 accurately simulated that is all that you would do at cruise um, as soon as, so those are all the things you would do as soon as you reach cruise and during cruise throughout the entire cruise phase. So we'll see you then in part three when we do the before descent, descent procedures, as well as uh, the landing and so on and so forth. So we'll see you then.